Gresham College presents Vienna and Schubert, Fantasy in F Minor, by Professor Christopher Hogwood, Gresham Professor of Music. Good afternoon, welcome. Congratulations, so many people have found their way to this very wonderful church. This is um, a tryout, as it were, for us, because as far as I know, we've never, never held uh, Gresham College meetings here before. So you will find more, not only my um, series of lectures for this season, but all, also uh, Roger Parker and the uh, various celebrations of Britain and his music next year. But um, for anybody who's here for the first time, this is one of the six uh, Hawksmoor churches built in London after the, the fire on the, the reconstruction of London, and it's by far the biggest. And you may feel sad, but you don't have to feel sad. What you see at the back is the casework of the biggest surviving English organ that was put into the church in 1735 by Richard Bridge. And it's not stolen. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong thing to say in this end of London. It's, it's gone away to be restored. And it will be back possibly next year and there'll be a great celebration because it, is, it will be the largest instrument um, of that sort that still exists that Handel would have played. So we're in a very historic building. You might wonder, therefore, why the theme of the first three of my lectures is Vienna. This is not a very Viennese surroundings, but you'll see towards the end of the season, we become more Baroque. At the other end of the year, we have um, a celebration of uh, London at the time of Handel. So the music you'll hear in this building will be exactly suited to the building. Uh, we will also have a celebration of Rome, uh, particularly since next year is a major anniversary for Arcangelo Corelli and his string music. But the first three lectures and programs of music are all directed not only at Vienna but also at Schubert. Vienna, of course, at the time this church was built, could not be ranked as a very grand or very central um, capital city to the goings-on in Europe. Uh, Rome may be, yes, certainly Paris, certainly Berlin, certainly London. Um, Vienna was much more an eastern city, a very, very mixed population. You find there uh, Poles, Bohemians, Moravians, Serbs, Croats, Turks, Greeks, very mixed, very much with its eyes to the east as well as to the, uh, the rest of Europe. It, the reason for its predominance and the reason for choosing it as a as an anchor point for several musical lectures is the fact that we have made it the center of our musical taste. Um, whether you agree with contemporary taste or not, most of the great composers that we are prepared to go and listen to in the proms or on the BBC or buy records of will be based around a Viennese tradition. So you will, you will have Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and Mahler and Strauss and Schoenberg. Um, it's, it's become the focal point of a lot of the musical thinking, the symphonic thinking, the operatic thinking, these major formats of European music. And so probably in musicians' eyes, Vienna looms as a much larger and more important uh, place than, say, in hi historians of politics or of medicine or of botany or of anything else. It was um, a surprisingly rural city. You may wonder why so much uh, of Schubert and Mozart and Beethoven sort of harks to the countryside. You didn't have to go very far in Vienna to meet either the countryside or people from foreign countrysides. You had market gardens within the city. It was a sort of almost self-contained community without a terrific amount of political clout, except for the fact that all the representative families of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the emperor, of course, were resident in the city 
some of the year. Uh, they mostly chose to be in Vienna during the cold months and out in their various estates all over Europe during the warm months, um, killing animals and drinking, the usual activities. But you celebrated, of course, this um, concatenation of aristocrats all in their various palaces by celebrating culture and the arts and patronage. So it was a wonderful magnet for people who felt they were not going to be sufficiently supported or rewarded in the outposts of the empire. So if you were a Czech or a Bohemian or a Moravian or a Pole or a Hungarian, you saw that it was to your advantage to go to Vienna to show what you could do, how you could play, how you could compose, how you could paint, how you could write, and look for a patron. Uh, Vienna, of course, was not as rich as we would like to think. Remember, um, by the early 19th century, the city had been occupied twice by foreign forces. So it had lost a great deal of cash and prestige, um, thanks to Napoleon, and was very much in debt. The currency had been devalued by nearly 50%. So it may sound familiar. Um, there was a general decline. Uh, you'll remember that after Haydn had finished working for the Esterhazy family in Hungary, but with their basis in, uh, in Vienna, uh, the orchestra for which he had written so many of his symphonies was disbanded. Uh, the the uh, successor to his patron, Prince Esterhazy, decided there was just not enough money around, and so everything was reduced to a, a skeleton force. So you have devaluation, you have economic crash. Um, the arts, therefore, tend to take over the place of politics as being the way you can influence things. And you had various people who would employ you if you were good. The state, of course, and the state-run activities, the state theatres, the state music, imperial music. Um, the church, uh, again, many competitive branches of the church and therefore church music. In the, in the theatres, there were five separate theatres in Vienna. That meant every theatre having musicians, because theatre was impossible to think of without music. Even straight plays had music before and after them. So there's plenty of employment for the um, orchestral players and for the composers. And, of course, in addition, there were plenty of coffee houses, bars, places where popular music would carry on. And the very welcoming attitude of Viennese, then as now, having you into their homes with home concerts, soirees, salons, competing aristocratic palaces, all promoting their own particular ends. And the younger generation just having regular meetings. Your career, if you settled on uh, Vienna as a place to live, could be as a composer if you were lucky. If you found a publisher, that was great. There were also publishers who centered on Vienna and transmitted their music around Europe. And what we tend to forget nowadays, also an enormous number of copyists. Printed music was not the only thing. Um, in the early 19th century, people were still copy, making manuscript copies of music to transmit throughout, um, throughout Europe, basically, and in some cases as far as America. You could also, if you were um, a musician, a composer, dedicate your music to somebody if you could manage to get their ear. So you'll notice all Beethoven's sonatas carry very elegant aristocratic dedications. Uh, this was, of course, a thank you in a way, but a dedication was expected to be acknowledged uh, by quite a large sum of money coming your way uh, in return for the fine print. You could be a teacher. Uh, there, it was the um, standard expectation that most people would be musically literate, that you would play one or two or possibly three instruments and have learned to sing. Um, the pay for a, um, a teacher, though, was much the same as the, the pay for a secretary. It wasn't uh, so grand. And you also, of course, as a music teacher in the 19th century, basically traveled to your pupils. They did not come to you. Uh, there was more to the music business in Vienna than publishing, particularly instrument building. 
um, by some reason, we don't quite know why, a lot of the keyboard organ makers, harpsichord makers, later piano makers who lived in Schweber had moved downwards into um, Vienna and it was a center of piano design, piano manufacture, um, piano teaching and piano concerts. This, uh, of course, made great sense economically when the orchestras were going broke. Uh, one of the major drawbacks you would find in Vienna that, um, if you remember Amadeus play and to a certain extent film, um, reminds you from early on in that drama that the secret police were a major feature of Viennese life. The emperor felt threatened by many things, not only from the rest of Europe, um, Napoleon and the French and big territorial designs on one side, but also, of course, Vienna had constantly been under threat from the east. So the idea of security was high on everybody's mind, and therefore the, um, the secret police did look into everything, and the censors had a word in nearly all music that was written, performed, um, and certainly published. You had to get by the official censorship. Um, Vienna was also, uh, I think, under the influence of musical crazes, perhaps no more than Paris, but probably more noticeably. The two most important ones that one should bear in mind um, while listening to mid-century Viennese music would be the arrival of Rossini with his Neapolitan opera company, and of course, the absolutely astounding arrival of Paganini uh, on the violin, um, amazing a city of musicians, which takes quite a lot of doing to impress the Viennese with, with a form of playing they hadn't advanced to. So you might then ask, um, okay, the Vienna therefore becomes a natural magnet for all these reasons for musical activities and product, but why Schubert three times? Well, it's worth remembering, I think, that a lot of the people we celebrate when we celebrate Viennese music uh, were not actually Viennese. Schubert is the only famous composer who was actually born in Vienna. The rest, uh, the Haydn's, the Mozart's, the Beethoven's, came from elsewhere because of the attractiveness of Vienna. So Schubert is really uh, the only Viennese amongst them. Um, he also carries, I think, like Haydn, the distinction, if that's the word, of being a non-virtuoso. Um, Haydn was very honest about his own playing on the piano and on the violin. He said, I am no great wizard. Um, he was a composer, but he couldn't, he couldn't match uh, the virtuosity, say, of a Beethoven or a Rossini or a, a Paganini, and therefore, the um, concert halls and the concert platforms for making your living from uh, showy recitals, that was something not open to Schubert. What he could do was match very well the, the need for what one might call Biedermeyer music, music acceptable to everybody, particularly the middle class who are now doing the financing of most of the uh, arts activities in Vienna. And so he wasn't worried by the fact that he was asked a lot of the time to provide convenient music, songs for soirees to be sung um, amongst a few friends without a public audience, uh, music for piano, ch chamber music, uh, music, as we shall hear, for piano duet. All these things, um, they could be performed and listened to and critiqued and enthused over uh, with very little outlay. Um, Schubert also suffered, of course, from that problem of dying young. So he wasn't around for long enough to do what the critics advised him to do. Curiously, the critics, most of them in Vienna, advised Schubert to write fewer songs. Um, we prize him for the enormous number of songs he was able to write. The critics said, oh, very fine and good, but these are good for soirees. Why does he not take a greater interest in the forms that really matter might be um, the opera, big symphonies, uh, big choral music. But in fact, when he tried this, uh, none of them really gave him much support. He had no regular patron. And so his milieu was almost always that of like-minded people 
who were enthusiasts, sometimes suspiciously revolutionary, sometimes fingered by the secret police, of course, as was Schubert. Um, but they could produce the music under their, on their own terms, under their own conditions, in their own homes. And so um, a series of sort of salons grew up around various intellectuals. There were some uh, literary salons, philosophical salons. Uh, there were a few sewing salons, which we don't hear very much about. But the most um, famous, of course, would be the salons promoting musical activities. And the ones around Schubert um, became christened, even in their own time, as Schubertiads. Um, he had um, some more wealthy bureaucratic friends. Vienna was a place where people, young men, went who joined the civil service, basically looking for a career in politics, making some money, running government departments. And on the strength of this um, income, they could run salons. Um, Spaun was the most famous person who supported uh, uh, Schubert's activities and he gave over his salon, organized uh, the food and the drink and the dancing which were always part of these activities. It wasn't just sitting and uh, listening to songs and exclaiming about literature. It was generally having a, a fine drunken time. Uh, there was curiously also a little bit of early music going on in Vienna. We, we sometimes forget that the history of of um, early music did exist in the 19th century. It's not a 20th century invention. There was um, a, a very important man who should be, I think, looked into more called Raphael Kisavetta, who ran salons aimed at producing music from the past. And he said to uh, uh, people who were asking, could they come and attend, he, he wrote a little message saying, please do not come with great expectations. It's only my small, domestic, portable and itinerant orchestra which gathers and the performers are impromptu. We meet at 6.30, make music until about 10, then we take some small refreshments which may also perhaps not end with singing. Um, it's in that milieu Kisabetta and his early music, he also supported several concerts by Schubert. And um, it's in that atmosphere, rather than a, a grand baroque atmosphere or even a public atmosphere, that you have to imagine this music taking place, played by a Viennese composer, Viennese friends, on a piano made in Vienna for the young um, Viennese, slightly wealthy middle class. So a very Biedermeier existence. We're very fortunate uh, today to have two lovely pianists from the Royal Academy uh, who are going to play one of the last pieces that Schubert wrote, uh, this, the fantasy in F minor. I think you have its basic facts on your programs, but it's worth, I think, as just looking at it a little bit and working out perhaps why it's a fantasy, how it functions, what is special about this music, and what is specially Schubertian about the way it's put together. So maybe we could start by introducing you and introducing some small excerpts from, uh, from th this particular piece. Bravo. <laughs> Schubert had written quite a few fantasies, quite a few pieces under the name of fantasy. Um, fantasy is the sort of name you give to something when the standard formats don't fit. You can't call it symphony for piano. You can't really call it a sonata for piano. It's in a single stretch, but it in fact has inside itself all the components even of a symphony. Um, once you've heard it, you'll, you'll understand the compulsion some people recently have had to actually orchestrate it, that it has all the language and stature of a piece designed for a grand orchestra. But as I said, Schubert didn't have access to a grand orchestra nor support for giving grand orchestral performances. Nearly all his orchestral works were performed either by an amateur orchestra or played once and then forgotten. He dedicated this uh, fantasy to Caroline Esterhazy, one of the Esterhazy family, of course, connected with Haydn, um, who was 
called in quotes the love of his life, but in fact, he, I think he was hoping basically that she might turn out to be a patron, and she didn't. Um, <clears throat> but in all, Schubert wrote some 30 pieces for four hands at one piano. There's a distinction between the piano duo, which usually means two pianos, I think nowadays would you take it in that sense, and the piano duet, which is four squashed onto one keyboard. You can even have six hands on one keyboard. I've never seen eight on one keyboard. It would get a bit tight. Um, <clears throat> but for domestic purposes, four on one keyboard is a great deal easier than trying to manage two uh, Viennese pianos and keep them in tune. Um, the fantasy begins, um, I think, in a typical Schubert way, with something which is clearly a song melody that once you've heard, you'll never forget. I say it's clearly a song melody because, rather like Mozart's G minor symphony, Mozart sets up the piece with the accompaniment before the melody enters. It's a very easy way of getting into your minds the idea that, okay, there's an accompanist, in this case the left hand, and then this wonderful, uh, unforgettable F minor melancholy tune employing quite few notes, uh, but it's definitely in this uh, somber, melancholic, the special, slightly acid tones that people associated with the key of F minor. Should we just hear the opening with the F minor version? The lovely thing about Schubert's use of minor keys and then relinquishing them is just like Mozart. He chooses the right moment to actually shift that same tune into the major, and you get the effect that somehow the major can manage often to sound sadder than the minor. It's just the struggle of reaching the major when, it, when you feel from the way it's been set up. It's not inherently uh, an F major tune. The other interesting thing about this piece and any fantasy, of course, is, as I say, it's a single um, through-running piece, as you'll see in your programs, though there are four major sections, exactly as you would expect um, in any symphonic work, or exactly like the movements of a sonata, an opening, a slow movement, a scherzo, and a finale. When they're put into, f into fantasy form, you have one extra challenge or possibility which is that the links between these sections have to be audible. With the Beethoven Sonata, in most cases, you will finish the first movement, <clears throat> clear your throat and blow your nose and look around and smile, and then you'll begin a second movement in a disconnected style or key or whatever. That will finish, and then we'll... It's quite rare for a couple of movements to be linked, uh, and it's almost impossible in a sonata for all movements to be to be conveniently linked. A fantasy, being a single canvas, goes through the business of making transitions. And it's in this, I think, that Schubert particularly excels. You'll notice um, how he gets from one point to another, both in mood and in key. You don't need to know a lot about the theory of harmony to realize that keys can be very remote from each other, even when they look on the keyboard as though they're adjacent, if you just give it an F minor chord, and if you just go up a semitone to F sharp minor, it's a big jolt. It's not an easy transition. You can, you can modulate through a lot of other keys to get there. And the trickery of Schubert is that he goes from an opening in F minor to the same very memorable melody in F major, and before you know what's happened, you've shifted through a lot of harmonies and ended up one semitone higher, which is 
um, quite an unnatural shift. Do you want to play the F major moment and then carry on into what constitutes the sort of second movement in sonata terminology? <laughs> Opening theme where where it comes just as itself in F, yeah. F major, just so that people see this. Yeah, this is this is the actual F major transfer. That one. It's turned back into F minor, but that smiling uh, F major episode is not really smiling, I think. Okay, um, just casting back where, where Schubert was getting some of his ideas, perhaps for shape, form, and gestures from, it's worth looking back to what he knew of previous piano duet music. There wasn't a great deal. Uh, Beethoven had written one or two lightish pieces. Um, Mozart, of course, had written four hand sonatas as well as two keyboard sonatas, but I think more important from the Mozart stable comes pieces that Mozart had written for mechanical organ. There'd been a, a, a special automaton um, in Vienna that could play extremely complicated music on a sort of flute organ, and the owner of this, Mr. Demel, had commissioned various composers to write new music for it. And Mozart wrote two fantasies, both in F, uh, that looked backwards to the, the style of the Baroque, as he saw it, a sort of Handelian style, which is very much like what you just heard in the, uh, the F-sharp minor moment with these lots of rumbling trills and dotted rhythms. This is uh, a natural sign, I think, of a leaning towards the Baroque. It sounds a bit like a Baroque. Uh, French overture or Handelian uh, rhythms. They felt it spelt out an earlier regime. And this is, this is just the opening of the uh, F minor fantasy written for mechanical organ. Although it was on a mechanical organ, it, Mozart had written it out on four staves to help the man who had to do the pinning of the barrels on this organ. Uh, it was in a sort of four stave score and the publisher took this to be a sign that it was a piano duet. In fact, it doesn't make a terribly easy piano duet. I think every, everybody knows, because your fingers are all inside each other. The parts are not written thoughtfully for the piano, not Mark Mozart's fault, because he wasn't, he wasn't thinking of it as such. But it came out in print in the 1790s, and therefore, of course, Schubert would be well aware of this, the key, the style, and the fact that it was taken as being music for four hands. You'll notice he begins very baroque, with lots of little gruppetti and jagged figures, and then almost immediately goes into a fugue, and Schubert is also going to go into a fugue in the end. This is the Mozart model.
as you see, when you write music for a mechanical instrument, there have to be no concessions to what fingers can actually play. So trills can occur all over the place and the parts can become as involved as you like. And it takes quite a bit of un untangling. Um, Schubert takes this as his cue. I think there can be no other explanation for why he chooses to, at the end of his fantasy, having quoted again and again the, this melancholic opening theme, he does derive a complete fugue from it. Let's maybe go from where the fugue uh, begins. Same complications, a little bit better laid out for the hands, I think, but not much better than the, than the Mozart example. Um, one movement we have missed out, we perhaps just to hear a little of the sketch. So the, the, the full format of the piece is fantasy opening, slower movement, repeat of the fantasy opening, little memories, um, and then a fully fledged sketch, so which could and has been very well orchestrated in orchestral manner. More of the fantasy opening and then the fugue, and after the fugue you get the, the bleakest possible cadence that Schubert ever devised that refuses to come back into the lots of crashing harmonies and refuses to, to end up in the major key as you might, might be hoping. But the one moment of, of more or less happiness in all of this is this um, exuberant scherzo. So you've had all the component parts. What we haven't shown you and which you will hear in the full performance, of course, is the ingenuity of getting between the one and the other, all of them in these, these extremely foreign keys that are extremely foreign to each other. But I think that puts together the component parts of the fantasy. Before we hear it, though, um, I'd like to just ask a few questions, if I may, of piano duet players. Yeah. It's a very unforgiving... Um, instrument, I think, for duet playing because it's immediately apparent if you haven't put a chord down together. <laughs> if you just say go and play, something will be a little scattergun because somebody won't do it. So it consists probably quite a lot of breathing together as yes. well. That's true, that's, that's one yes. of the secrets. We have to breathe together. And also, uh, it's uh, quite interesting because when we play solo, um, we tend to emphasize more the right hand and the left hand is more accompaniment-like, depending on the pieces, of course. But when we play together, we have to forget that, for example, Florian's right hand is not the main voice. Uh, it should be sort of, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's mostly an accompaniment and this is a bit tricky, you know, you yeah. have to get used to toning it down. Yeah. And, this and is one has to remember also at the bot when you're the bottom pianist, that while your right hand is a middle voice, mm -hmm. your left hand, the bass, is supporting three other hands above yeah. it, not just one, so yes. even, even more important. Yes. Do you find that there's good teaching? And um, this is just thinking of, of things like schedules of belonging to a, um, a conservatoire and what the, what the Royal Academy does for, does it take, 
the teaching of forehand music as seriously as solo music? Definitely. Oh. I think it does when, when students have the initiative. We, we have been very, very generously supported by the Academy. We've received coaching from our piano teacher, from our chamber music coaches, but also um, we've recently performed in a masterclass given by Imogen Cooper, which we, we thought it was a fantastic opportunity because yeah. she herself has, has a wonderful experience in playing this sort of music and and it, it was a life-changing experience yes, really um, because we we have done concerts together but this really changed our, our way of, of, of looking at this repertoire. What, what sort of things did she turn up that you hadn't thought of before? Um, mainly the the emphasized unity between ourselves I think we were we're, I think we were doing our job quite well. We were counting together and we were mainly together, but uh, it wasn't just the physical action of, of playing the chords together, but also the tone quality, getting it, mm. getting it very um, um, un unified in, in a sense. Uh, because the, 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 there's a big danger of, of sounding very bombastic and loud. Where is, the piano is a loud, can be a loud instrument. Uh, so you get two people very enthusiastic about the music they play. It can sound very, um, very, very loud. So it, it, it's, a, it's a question of, of tempering down um, um, our personalities, not in a bad way, but like to, to create a new personality that is uh, formed by... Mm. And you were, you were playing for her forehand? Uh, yes, we Mozart. played the Mozart. 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 Yeah. Um, sonata. F major sonata, yeah. All right, yeah, right. Um, if you come to... Do you play also two pianos? Uh, not yet. We haven't, we haven't got to play. I can't ask you about the, the difficulties, of course. It's clear how you can organize yourselves when you're sitting next yeah. to somebody and, and playing. The thing is, when they're facing you with a, you know, a nine-foot Steinway between you and them, two nine-foot Steinways between you and them, um, it's a quite different system yeah. done, of navigation, I find, the, the, the sort of... Um, yes. Um, We've done... I, I've Pelmanism, done, you know, I don't know, you know in yeah. the, the, the We've connection. We've had uh, separate opportunities to yeah. perform with uh, two pianos. I've I think you've done Bartok sonata. Two double piano concertos. Yeah. Yeah. We've done the Bach double and Bartok double in the sonata version. And yeah. I've, done, I've done something more contemporary, Reich variations for two pianos, vibraphones and string quartets. And also the pianos were set up to opposite. And it was quite interesting. You know, yeah. we had to look a lot of each yeah, other signals. and yes. plus the conductor and... <laughs> The interesting thing to remember, of course, is probably when Schubert played this, it was only a few months before he died. It was at a hastily arranged musical soiree. I suspect it wasn't rehearsed. It might well have I think been, it's yes. pro probably you are hearing now a much better polished and rehearsed performance than the composer himself himself ever heard. That goes for a great deal of music that we hear nowadays. So <laughs> put it back into its Biedermeyer context of uh, a jovial crowd of enthusiastic young bohemians in, in Vienna being entertained by uh, Schubert and his friend Lachner. Um, the one performance, I suspect, that they, that they were able to give while Schubert was alive of this fantastic F minor fantasy. Thank you.
For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.